Hello everybody and welcome as we are into week three of the meta season here and we've got two new teams for us today. But before we dive into that, I believe a little bit of introductions are in order. My name is Midnight and I've been joined by Replays for our first game of the night. Yeah, it's fantastic to be back on Meta after a little bit of a brief stint afterwards and uh, getting involved with more high school esports here between Bass High School and Black's, Land, Black's Hand sorry, High School uh, facing off in uh, the third week of our competition here. Uh, good to see all these players getting involved in, of course, grassroots high school esports and excited to see what kind of entertainment they're going to bring to us tonight. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see. Over the last two weeks, we've had a different variety of gameplay coming out from teams. Some teams leaning very heavily towards... Uh, personal comfort um, and basically disregarding the meta in its entirety and on the other side I've seen a few teams really focus on oh yeah this champion's top tier we'll grab it and then realize oh this doesn't fit with our team composition so my eyes are always going to be on what personal picks have people got in their back pockets ready to go. Yeah, precisely. And when you're playing these kind of lower bronze to gold kind of uh, ELO games, right? obviously this game is a little bit different. When you look at players in lobby, there's some slightly high ranked players, but not high enough to be considered high ELO per se. Um, but you always want to try and look towards very simple champions or champions that you know how to play. If you're a Zed one trick, even though if you might be like a 42% winner on Zed, it's better you pick in that champion than like Syndra, for example, because at least you know how to play it. And rather if you, you know, fall behind or can't keep up, uh, in the game, you still know exactly what you're doing. You can still have some impact on that. But if you're playing one of these meta champions that you know, you're know you not too sure on exactly how to play it, if you end up falling behind or, or falling out of order, it's going to be so difficult to go back into the game. Exactly. My first thought when, we think, when we're talking about these champions would be the likes of the Aphelios for the role of the AD carry. If you can play mm. him, he's insanely powerful. But if you don't know how to play him and then you decide, oh, he's really strong, I'm going to pull him out into the game... You realize, oh God, what do all my different guns do? And then you're 0 and 5 at 15 minutes. It's like, oh dear Lord. So stick to comfort, stick to what you know. Precisely. Even if it's not meta, right? Meta doesn't really matter. As long as you're a better player than the opposition, that's all that matters when you're playing in low elo. Uh, when, of course, when you get up to meta, uh, sorry, like a high elo competition, or you see towards the end of this, uh, you know, the finals of each region, when you're getting teams that have got a couple diamond players in there, you might seem slightly going towards those champion power picks. But at the end of the day, uh, down in this elo, you're not playing well enough to actually utilize the strengths and weaknesses of the champions that make that difference at the highest level of play. So as long as you're just performing at a baseline level, that's all you're going to need to do. Yeah, and we're very, I'm very excited to see what they've got in store for us. So over the last two weeks, three plays, we've seen some interesting choices throughout the course, and I'm very excited to see what these two teams have in store for us. As hopefully we'll be getting into the... First game of tonight very shortly. I do want to ask a couple ask you a question. Now, this question specifically, yes, we're talking about our meta versus comfort. You talked about this likening, go for the simpler champions. What champion do you think could have a great impact that is, as you're saying, relatively simple to execute? Annie. <laughs> oh god. Buff. Annie got a massive buff to her ultimate, which adds like an extra, I think, two hundred health to her kill combo. Um, so, and Annie is one of the easiest champions to play in the game. You don't even need to practice her. You can just lock it in and you're good to go if you know how to play her vision correctly. Um, but realistically, uh, probably the best champion I reckon for low elo is something like a Mumu. A Mumu's really strong actually because uh, he still has a decent amount of damage. So you're not missing out in that uh, regard, but you're also able to, uh, you know, have that massive team fight impact ultimate. And then from that, you're also allowed to, or able to then combo that with some other champions like the MF, for example. MF and Mumu is a classic combination that's been around for a very long time. And that allows, uh, the players in these teams to, to set up easy team fights and, and, and playing these strategies like the team fight strategy is so much easier to execute in terms of uh, when you're looking at like performance-based, right? Yeah, and it's something we do see a lot in the bot lane specifically is these engaged supports, the Leona. Very similar role to the Amumu, admittedly a bit of a smaller ultimate range for the stun. And of course, Nautilus, insane engage potential. So hopefully we'll see a bit of engage coming up both these teams. A lot of fighting as it looks like Pick and Ban is about to kick off here. And it's time to see which teams have done their research and say, okay, we need to get rid of this pocket pick or do we target the meta? Yeah, exactly right. You're going to see the first few bands in, in this band phase are going to be targeting out one tricks or uh, targeting out, you know, one player's certain pool. And Vyga is one of those champions who is definitely a one trick or champion, not meta at all. Um, and we'll see that targeted towards the mid laner, you'd assume, for effort live on. Yeah, and Vyga, if you let him, 
Like, that's the thing with stacking champions. It's Vygar, the Scion, the Nasus. If you don't actively play up in their face and make their life a living hell for the first 20 minutes of the game, you then realize they've got three items, they've got God knows how many stacks, and now they're able to one-shot your marksman from about three quarters HP. So I love <laughs> to see that one getting taken away. I may be a bit of a Nasus one-trick, so that is relevant to the point. <laughs> As another band that I love to see, the Leona we talked about during Pick and Band, the engaged potential coming from support. Precisely right. Playing that slightly more aggressive champion lane does require a little bit more skill, but it's very easy to execute and puts a lot of pressure and punishes mistakes quite easily. That's one of the things you see on low elo that, that players make a lot is they make a significant amount of mistakes. So playing champions that are easily able to adapt and punish those mistakes is the best way to go. That's why stuff like Malzahar, Annie, Vega are so prevalent because they are so good at punishing mistakes. Um, Vega as well as, you know, a fantastic champion for zoning out, especially in low elo, that um, event horizon just zones out so much of uh, any team fight river, uh, any team fight you're gonna have in the river. So you see Thresh getting banned out as well, Set, Warwick, and Leona, maybe slightly stronger champions, actually a little bit uh, less easy to play per se. Um, but obviously we'll see what the final ban is coming in uh, from the red side here. But overall, yeah. this pick ban's been going as expected. Yeah, Silas, unsurprising. I've seen a few highlight plays mm. of him recently, and he is a nightmare to deal with with all his healing. Uh, and the one interesting ban is actually the Warwick. Every week of meta, we have seen a Warwick in at least one of our games. So, obviously, the dog's pretty popular today. I mean, Warwick is one of those champions that is so simple to play and has a fantastic uh, ultimate that's able to execute effectively. Uh, mm. And, you know, is has very good clear, very healthy clear, and is a very... Uh, uh, sorry, jungle like new jungler friendly, right? One of those champions, it's very hard to die in, in the jungle. You see a lot of junglers going down to wolves or raptors or whatever. If they're you know not used to playing their old Silas, especially is one of those junglers that kind of falls away. But I've been picking up a bit of Silas jungle just recently. Um, but Warwick is definitely a, you know a champion that you don't want the other team to have because it allows them so many options to get into the game. Yeah, well, I said that's not going to be getting it through here, but the picks are coming through, and the interesting one to me, the Aureli can get quite explosive, but the Shen. That already tells me that baseball, they're already leaning towards maybe a, a hyper carry style because you don't typically pick Shen if you want just a standard tank. I'm pretty sure that falls to the Maokai role that we're seeing on the other side of the rift. Yeah, precisely. I mean, it also allows uh, for like a 1-3-1 one, one comp kind of option or 1-4 split comp uh, potentially option <laughs> Shen. Of course, not the best split pusher, but the fact he has double global pressure means that it's very difficult to match him effectively and he can apply a lot of pressure and get out quite quickly with that both that stand united and of course a teleport if he opts to go for that uh summoner spell uh really is a very risky lock in we see here uh on the red side uh one of the champions that you know is a little bit higher skill cap and requires a little bit more mechanical ability to play and is also flexible between the mid and uh, top role. So we'll have to see exactly where that champion ends up. And Malkai as well, uh, you'd expect to see top lane, but with this Aurelia lock in, could also be going maybe support or even in the jungle the role it's been picked for. Yeah, the flexibility of the Malkai is what's maybe a little bit off putting is that, like, for example, when we look at baseball, we know, relatively speaking, that Nautilus support, Javan jungle, Shen top. We know where they're going. Now, on the other side, Aurelia could be top or mid. Malkai could be top or support now. And at least, pretty much has to be the jungle. So for baseball, their life is a little bit harder because they have to start caging out, okay, who do we want mid lane that can actually handle an Aurelia? Yeah, precisely, right? There's a lot of options they have available. I mean, they did ban that Vega, which is one of the best answers to the Aurelia because of the amount of dashes he has. We could see something um, kind of uh, a bit cheesy, like a, a, maybe a poppy mid or something like that. But this Nautilus could also go mid too, right? It could be Nort mid, could be join be inspired pick. Uh, in the mid lane there, um, but as interesting as you know, Azir banned out by the uh, by Blacksland. The Azir, I did do a little bit of scouting. Spooks plays a filthy amount of that champion, so I actually do love to see the Azir ban here. Um, so I'm pretty sure I'll double check real quick for me, but Spooks has played nothing but Azir for the last two days, minus one game of Pike where he was filled into support. So yeah, one of those targeting the one tricks ideas that were coming out. Azir is a very interesting champion to one trick too. One of the uh, hardest champions to play in the game. And Kalista as well, uh, being banned out too. Probably more meta bans. Obviously, depends what NBA Youngboat plays uh, in particular. But there are still a lot of high priority AD carries up. But we haven't really seen a single AD carry ban besides that Kalista that just came through there. Yeah, and I think part of the reason is um, AD carries are in a little bit of a weird spot right now, if I'm not mistaken, where there are some that just don't have the impact. And then people have started playing like Syndra bot lane. Um, and Yasuo, I know I've seen a lot of Yasuo Alistair recently, 
So marksmen aren't in the greatest spot, it seems, at least in people's opinions. So we'll see. Yeah, there it is, the Syndra. So that's more than likely a Syndra bot lane. Yeah, I mean, given the fact that we're looking at everyone else has been locked in, uh, unless, of course, this is maybe a Maokai support and they're still waiting to lock in that AD carry. But yeah, stuff like the Varus has been uh, high priority down this bot lane. Um, obviously, close to MF and, and Aphelios are those kind of top four um, marksmen before you go down to the next tier. Um, but looks like Vayne could be a lock in here, which is a very uh, interesting lock in. Uh, okay. Vayne, oh, there we go, that's much better. Misfortune Nautilus is a much safer lane. Of course, Nautilus could still be going mid. We'll have to see exactly uh, what Bass decide to go for in the mid lane there with Spooks, obviously, with his Azir being taken off the table. I'll we'll have to see exactly what he picks up. You may be expecting something similar to the Azir or something that rounds out this very heavy oriented teamfight comp, something like maybe a Galio could be assisted very well. Um, or maybe even, yeah, Rise too. You see, it is locked in there. Similar to Azir, provides fantastic team fight damage. Offers a one three one option too for their composition with Shen and Rise uh, in those side lanes. We want to see what the answer is here out of uh, Blackson. I mean, the hover in the vein. I would be amazed if I actually locked this in. Never well, mind that. I'm you're amazed. Gonna be amazed. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say, didn't I? <laughs> That's a jinx it there. It looks like it will be a rally up into the Shen in the top side. Uh, Syndra into the rise in the mid lane, and then of course, a uh, Maokai support is uh, obviously something I've been seeing a little bit in recently in my games, but um, I'm not sure if it's maybe the strongest option you could possibly go for, but uh, regardless, we'll have to see exactly how it's pulled out. I mean, it offers that extra, uh, you know, CC ability in the bot lane. Uh, also, uh, you know, in answer to the Nautilus, could maybe counter the, the root part of his uh, auto attack when he's like, amazing CC the champion offers. Um, but we'll have to see exactly what ends up happening as we will get into game very shortly. Of course, had a three minute spectator delay, but I mean, from these drafts in particular, it's, I mean, very much for me, I'm, I'm heading towards Bass in the blue side here. Who's going to take the win? They have such an easy to execute comp rise. is probably the only champion that's a little bit more mechanically difficult, but given the fact that Spooks has played a lot of Azir, obviously has uh, decent mechanics developed there and should be able to pull off this champion quite effectively. Uh, there might be a, a, you know, a slight, uh, issue for them in the early game uh, as Rise is, you know, not particularly a strong laner, but this Draven should be a strong enough 2v2 force uh, that they'll be to at least contest Syndra Elise uh, if Rise goes for an early Merc Treads or something like that because Elise as well is a champion I haven't seen a lot of in the high school esports in particular. She's quite difficult to play uh, and, you know, revolves around making sure you're having a very high pressure early ganking style. So I could see this Elise and Aurelia focusing quite heavily up if Aurelia is going into the top side. We don't know exactly where these champions are ending up, but you can only assume she's going up on the top side. Uh, and just diving the Shen over and over in the early game because Elise does have one of the best dives in the game outside of maybe Pantheon jungle as well. Um, being able to get that repel off and, and avoid drop the tower aggro. And I could definitely see them focusing towards this top side. Yeah, and that's something I do want to actually look at a little bit is the Elise. Now, as you said, Elise, she has to be super proactive early game. And typically, um, when we're looking at the lines of pro play, you see Elise paired up with the likes of the Renekton, because Renekton has a ton of damage, and of course, point and click crowd control. Now, we look at the rest of the team, Maokai point and click crowd control, and Aurelia, it's not point and click, but it's pretty damn close with her E. So, out of the lanes that have, you know, preset crowd control, look at the Maokai, look at the Aurelia, I don't see, like, Syndra, yeah, but it's not reliable enough. Like, you have to be mm -hmm. damn good at the champion. Who would you think that this Elise really needs to focus on to get their lane partner ahead? Because eventually, Elise falls off. So Elise needs to get at least one person on her team super far ahead. Replays, who would you aim for? I mean, uh, I said it before, I'll say it again. I think the Aurelia up in the top side is crucial focus, right? Uh, for starters, it has damage um, parallel, not parallel, it has damage different, right? The Elise offers ability power with the uh, Aurelia is going to be focusing more towards attack damage. So then Shen, it's going to be a little bit difficult, more difficult, sorry, for Shen to itemize. It's also one of the lane matchups that's the most crucial. If Aurelia can get ahead and get an early Bork, she's really going to start snowballing through that top side and being able to 1v2 uh, Shen, Jarvan, Rise, whoever comes up there. And uh, also with, uh, obviously, she's taking the, I'm assuming she's taking Tenacity Rune, is, is expected versus a heavy CC comp like this. Uh, you'll be able to work through that comp much easier. And once you get that Blade of the Rune King available, should be a lot more effective in 2v3ing, 1v2ing, and that at least to support her with the Cocoon means uh, the stun floors duet is going to be even easier to hit for the Aurelia. Yeah, now, of course... We know this, there's a high chance that these players coming into this game have a pretty good idea of, okay, Elise, early game power. Now, I'm bragging us onto the other side of the rift on the side of uh, baseball, and of course they have the Jarvan in the jungle. 
still a relatively good early game jungler, as we've said. How will he be able to, does he want to say, be the one to counter gank the Elise? Does he simply want to gank when she's not there? What do we look at from Lachlan 27's Jarvan to have an impact in the game where his team doesn't fall 5,000 gold behind at 10 minutes because, you know, Elise is super proactive? Yeah, I mean, definitely one area of focus if you're looking towards the Jarvan in particular is the bot lane, right? The bot lane is where, um, if you're looking at jungle, you want to look at the, your lanes that are going to have the most 50-50 matchups, right? The matchups that can easily go either way or a matchup that you can drastically accelerate ahead. A vain Maokai lane is not a very uh, meta lane and not really unnecessarily a good lane that's able to sustain and focus throughout you know, a long period of time, right? If you can get this vein behind, she's going to be very useless. She's also very close range and so is very susceptible to uh, poke and engages from MF and Nautilus as well as Jarwin's uh, EQ flash combination. So if she if he can get some easy ganks towards this bot side and get the MF ahead, um, you know, that's probably where they want to focus, especially given the fact they've selected Shen. Shen is a very good weak side laner. Um, and so obviously with the summoner spells, actually, I don't know where, maybe it's, is it Syndra support? It actually might be Syndra. It, yeah, it's a Syndra support. Not okay. That's going to be exciting <laughs> to look into. I will right, we'll finish yeah, Shen just... and then we'll come to Syndra in a second because I'm so excited <laughs> to dive into that. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Um, I mean, I believe that actually, before we get into that, we will be taking a short break to uh, get into game sync up. So we're all at 10 seconds. That's the problem with online broadcasting, but uh, it shouldn't be too big of a delay. So we'll see you guys back in about you know, a minute or so. All right, guys, we'll be loading into the game in just a moment. However, there are a few exciting things that we want to break down and dissect. So, of course, we did see the lineup of uh, Blackland here. They have done a, something a little bit interesting. They've thrown the Maokai top lane, um, and they've put the... <laughs> the Sinja, I'm so amazed by this one. Uh, they've put the Sinja down in the bot lane as a support. Now... My first thoughts and replays, I will ask for, because I don't play a whole lot of bot lane anymore, especially with engaged supports, but my worry is that I see a misfortune, strong in the early game. I see a Nautilus who is very good at engaging. Now I see a short rain vein and a very squishy mage support. I'm kind of expecting just constant engages coming out from the side of Faithful High School. Yeah, I mean, if I'm this job and I've just gone like from, wow, my mid my strategy was to gank this uh, Maokai Syndra to instantly, oh, bot lane's so free. I'm going to go bot lane and get a thousand kills because uh, although, sure, Syndra has the scout of the week that's able to give herself a little bit of distance, Vayne and Syndra are both extremely squishy champions that aren't going to be able to function so effectively in this lane. So given the fact that Jarvan's going to be able to go down there, it's going to be so difficult for them to really fight. Yeah, it's going to be... Oh, it just, it's thrown my whole game plan out of the window. And the question for baseball is, how do they react to this? Because as you just said before, they need to now look at the game state, say, okay, it's not what we were expecting. How do we adapt? And seeing Jarvan start on the bottom half of the map actually does worry me a little bit. Because as a jungler, uh, you have like one of like three strategies. And the one I feel like is effective for Jarvan is rush red buff, red, rush your two major buffs, red and blue. Maybe grab yourself one extra camp, but then quickly gank. And the fact he's starting on the bottom side may actually slow that down, because as we were talking about, this bottom lane seems to be the ideal target. Yeah, I mean, precisely. I mean, the other thing the Java also now has to think about is the fact that Aurelia is in the mid lane, uh, given, you know, we didn't know where that was going, right? The Aurelia is now in the mid lane, which means Elise is going to focus very heavily towards this Rise Aurelia matchup. Aurelia is a champion that needs to snowball. Uh, or it doesn't need to, but... but if she snowballs, she can get a very far ahead and be extremely oppressive. 
So if this Rise is going to fall behind in the early game, uh, you're going to see Elise trying to focus towards him and this Aurelia. Jarvan's going to need to make sure he looks after the mid lane and the bot lane, so he's going to be playing primarily bot side this game, uh, which then means that he needs to start blue and path towards the lane he's going to gank. Right? It also helps if he starts from the blue side uh, because he then also is able to access Gromp very early on. Gromp's probably the best value camp at the moment ever since the jungle got changed back in patch 10.3, I think. Um, <clears throat> so it's a large requirement to, to get that camp early on, and that means he'll be hitting his level 3 off those three camps uh, and being able to influence his lanes with that slow as we see. Up on the top side, Shen going with an aggressive trade early on, but Mal I mean, this lane is just very much going to be a tank matchup. Shen's going to win it because of his percent health damage on the Q, um, but it's going to be a very interesting, just a big wet noodle fight we're going to see throughout the rest of the game. Yeah, and yeah, he's going to win the matchup in the top lane, but it's against a Maokai. Maokai doesn't really lose lane unless you're constantly killing him, and I don't see that happening there in the top lane. Now, uh, tracking of our two junglers, as we're saying, that's super important. Jarvan poked his nose top lane and did actually force a flash out of the Maokai, but now we're seeing a gank coming in here. The Aurelia, can she do a setup for the Elise? Not really, Spooks is able to get out, and while he will be down a little bit, like, he's up in CS already, he should be fine. Yeah, I mean, one of the most frustrating things to play against is a rise with that phase rush. He just has so much instant movement speed, EQ auto or even EWQ or anything like that. He just instantly runs away from you and there's nothing you can do. It's nothing more frustrating to play against uh, when your jungler finally comes to that gank. And there was a good opportunity as well from Eternal Rest there to see that there was an ability, uh, sorry, an availability for a gank in the mid lane. Jarvan uh, showed top and was very quickly able to react to that and try to get this Aurelia ahead. Um, Aurelia getting a little bit of CS lead now, but obviously Rise is going to bounce back and catch that next wave, but Elise still hovering around, so Spooks has to be very careful when he wake, walks up for this next wave. Yeah, and Spooks has gone for a bit of an interesting summoner spell, um, of course, in that teleport. Now, typically, I like the teleport on the Rise with two exceptions. That is, with a Sejuani jungle against you, or against an Elise, because both are very reliant on landing crowd control to set up for the follow through of their gank. So, hope as long as Spooks doesn't die to the early game aggression, he should be good to go there. And outside of that, there's no other real keystones or masteries that look a little bit spooky. Everything's kind of what we expect, even the Syndra running electrocute in the bottom lane. Yeah, I mean, I actually wouldn't expect the phase rush coming out of Syndra. We've seen that uh, been a little bit more popularized recently. It's, ooh, nah, just the phase rush just lets the rise run away. It does take a heavy trade, though, so going to have to be a little bit more careful now. Jarvan is around there to help him stay uh, alive, but Jarvan is, you know, trying to look for something mid, which is a bit interesting. Yeah, they need to get some CC down, but Spooks is not able to get the room prison. Talking about a gang, so set up on the top lane. The Maokai CC is enough to catch up the Shen. Flash will not save him. First blood grab. But Ever flashing in the wrong direction. Lachlan, of course, not choosing to burn his flash. Spooks misses the Q. He needs a couple more auto attacks, but the reinforcements are coming. Doesn't matter what order is enough. And there we go. Trades in both lanes. And if anything, I'd say this is much more valuable for the Rise and the blue side as a whole. Uh, Bass will now one kill on this Rise, which is what they rely on to scale. Spooks, also the highest ELO player, one of the, you know, obviously corrects that they're looking towards scaling and was getting an advantage in a lane where he's at a disadvantage, right? This Aurelia now had to burn the TP to get back to the lane. Interesting to see Aurelia took TP actually. I'd expect the Ignite when you're playing into a rise and a raid, a lane, sorry, you want to play quite aggressively. Um, but, you know, this kill on the Maokai slash Elise isn't really going to change too much. Uh, it's a pretty even matchup and neither of these two tanks are going to matter if they're too far behind. Um, but yeah, in this mid lane, that extra kill on the rise means he'll be looking towards getting that tier immediately. Uh, almost about to get his next, uh, get close to getting that rower too, which he needs to scale even more effectively into the later game. If he's able to get that, he's going to become absolutely unstoppable. Yeah, going to be that split push threat. And maybe that's partly why Effort has elected to grab the teleport, thinking about the later game saying, hey, I need to be able to deal with the split push threat of the rise. And of course, maybe even being a split push threat herself if he gets strong enough with the Aurelia. Now, once again, I'm going to bring our eyes to the jungle. That's where I feel like a lot of early game resides from. And the Elise, yes, one successful gank, but I feel like she can't just sort of be sitting back and farming up. Yes, you need farm. Yes, it's important. But you're an Elise. You're on a timer before you kind of become an irrelevant champion in the late game. So I want to see more proactiveness coming out. So seeing that in the middle lane here from Lachlan, ganking on the Aurelia, level 6 on her. The fine dance, and of course the play's coming out. Might get enough. One more hit to prove actually get the kill. Evan. Turns around, 2v1, a teleport coming in from the stand. United, the Shen has arrived to keep his jungle alive. 
But a miscommunication. CC train all aboard, Omu. You're going down. And that's a fantastic play from uh, Blacksland High School there. Uh, great communication with your Maokai teleporting down to follow the, the Shen. There's the difficulty of ganking an Aurelia early on. She had that um, lifesteal item completed, so was able to steal quite a bit back. Got that two-man ultimate too, so was able to get two Q stacks, and obviously up to that five uh, stack passive. Once she gets five stacks in her passive, she's just so oppressive and so uh, difficult to deal with in the bot lane. Yeah, fight in the bottom lane. We saw some bitch shenanigans. No one actually going to go down there. Oh, that's close though. And these bottom lanes have been relatively peaceful, despite the fact that you can't, you should expect, you know, the Nautilus and the Misfortune to be a lot more aggressive in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Misfortune just waiting and, and just trying to farm up a little bit. Maybe not getting any opportunities uh, down the bot lane. We saw a couple of hooks coming out from Nautilus, but there's nothing much going on. Cinder has actually been surprisingly decent at denying the engage opportunities and has been playing around that vision quite effectively. Um, but now we see level six on the Misfortune. Uh, and level six on Nautilus coming soon. Uh, it's gonna see we're gonna see a big engage here with this uh, bullet time able to do a lot of damage to both these two uh, enemy bot laners. Yeah, they're pushing the wave out. Probably want to recall considering that their opponents have successfully bought, you know, Bilgewater Cutlass for the vein. Nothing surprising there. Bilgewater Cutlass as well for Aurelia in the middle lane. Items pretty much exactly what we expect here. And now I'm going to start keeping eyes on the objectives. Typically, you know, teams are putting a lot of love onto the Rift Herald and, of course, the Dragon in the early game, trying to scale up to the Elder. Despite having two relatively early game junglers, neither team has actually poked their nose at any of the key objectives right now. I'm just sort of happy to let the laning place play itself out. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to Dragons in particular, right, I mean, I can't actually... My objective timers aren't... Uh... On my uh, spectator, because for some reason they glitch and I can't see even the jungle camp, so it's a little bit more difficult for me to suss. But uh, generally, you'd expect the, the red side to uh, want to get these dragons a lot more. That's more important for them uh, in the later game to have those uh, as they kind of uh, bridge scaling gaps, which you kind of have with Elise and the uh, Aurelia a little bit. So you see, maybe something happening on the Malkai, but Elise will be around for this back. Lachlan trying to back away, does get the CC train all on board for the Jarvan. He's going to get taken down immediately. The burst coming out of this lead, this uh, Elise, sorry, is ridiculous. And that is probably going to be a free Rift Herald. Yeah, wow, that's a lot of damage going over. I did not expect that at all to come out of the Elise, but... Oh, oh what the? That's a fun interaction there. Syndra being usual in this bottom lane, now getting some more damage down and... I'm kind of surprised it didn't commit onto that one. Vayne, she's low. You can easily just CC her down, but Domino's not wanting to commit. Yeah, I mean, unable to actually land that hook onto the Vayne, as we see here. Syndra, oh, not able to get around, but... Uh, yeah, both these sides are looking very successful, and Ryze may be looking for something down the bottom. side. Oh, he has the Realm Warp available, but it'd have to be basically a tower dive, because he's walking on top of Vision. So, DN4 as well as Chiru know what's coming in. In fact, they go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was amazing. I've uh, never seen that combo before. That's amazing. Not what they were looking for, I don't think. The credit. That, that's rather unfortunate there for the vein. Unfortunately, missed all attacking, but this Rift got dropped in the mid lane and they'll be uh, picking up a couple of plates there. It's even more gold going on to this Aurelia who's opened up a. Uh, you know, a sizable 600 gold lead already on the rise. And uh, as the champion, you know, usually expect to fall behind at the rise. It's, it's Once Israelia gets the Blade of the Ruin King, it's such a huge power spike for her. And she's going to be so hard to deal with once she gets this item. And Rise might even uh, be unable to go for that uh, row as we see him getting the uh, Amplifying. Gonna die. No, a lovely flash in the center. This could actually turn around. Young Boat out of mana. They will be forced to back away as I see at least coming up. Let's see if the spider can do anything. The Shen arriving proactively. And now Cannon, a lovely hook coming in. That is going to be Eternal Rest going down on May not as he does jump into the second. And now Effort on the front line very far forward. He's going to go down very early. He's like, what's my time to get to second? As Domino goes down on the far end of the fight. We've seen the re-engage coming through. Vayne diving forwards onto the Shen. The Shen getting torn apart by those Silver Bolts. A stun landing onto Spook. Spook should be able to get out in one piece. And despite the scrappiness of the fight, only one person actually dies, that being Domino. 
Yeah, I mean, what a fight from Blackson. They've just been playing so well this game. I had uh, them definitely not picked to win this game, but you can see already they're just so far ahead and they're just able to team fight and have this so much better team synergy. They seem to always be working together and be able to recover, even though it was a great play from the blue team to have all five members down there. Um, red team just was so e eager to respond and was ready for that, uh, you know, maybe counter gang. And Malka already down there burning a the TP once again to follow the Shen State United has been doing so well with generally, you know, the biggest thing about Chen is the fact that he has so much global pressure and he's just been unable to use any of that to really get his team a lead in this game. And that's really handicapped the, the pick of the Shen. And it's looking so good right now for the red side. Yeah, inside here, oh, but Blackland has done quite a nice job to build themselves up. First turret in the risk of going down here as the Blade of the Ruin King has been secured by this Aurelia here. Build up that nice lead, and I think part of that lead is definitely, we saw the Roan come down from the Rise being a bit unsuccessful as Rutero was dropped mid, so a lot of turret gold being donated over to the Aurelia here. And this Elise, 2 0 and 2 at the 12 and a half minute mark, give take, has actually done a super good job of playing that really practice style that you have to do as an Elise. Yeah, precisely. So you do quite well as we get it. Oh, in the bot lane. Oh, the oh, okay. yes, uh, says good night! And the bullet time coming out to Shiro Shiro will force to run away. Ouch! Ken, what an engager. You can see the power of this bot lane once Nautilus lands that hook post level 6. So much CC coming down in Java, of course, around two to shut down this vein who was starting to get a little bit out of hand, but oh, Java in a little strange to face release. Yeah, in a lot of trouble here. We'll get torn apart there. Sheru actually picking up the kill himself. So thank you very much for that. Lachlan's early game has been been pretty rough here, and it looks like it's about to get rough. I see a teleport coming to the back line. We're seeing proactivity, and Shen is nowhere to be seen. Irony here that the Shen team is simply getting out macroed as one will fall. Domino. Forced the flash, hooked himself to safety. Eternal rest, maybe forced to let him go. But you're being, you're out macroing a team with a shed. Yeah, I mean, that's rather impressive the fact that this Maokai has had so much more global map pressure than the Shen. is just credit to uh, Obo... I'm not going to attempt that second part of his name. Um, but Maokai, anyways, up in the top side, has been doing so well this game and has, in my opinion, so far been one of the best players. And you see... The tower as well getting hit by that demolish means that they're just gonna plow through this tower and the red side, despite having you know disadvantaged matchups, especially down on this bot side, are taking that first blood tower. Yeah, and the middle lane isn't exactly looking too healthy for the side of baseball either, so that won't be exactly long for the world as look at the minimap. I see DN4, Cheru, and of course the rest of the team rotating up towards that middle lane. Rise, he's basically Ralph Wiggum at this point because I think he knows he's in danger, but damn, are we about to see him get dived on and torn apart. Yeah, that was just an instant demolish there of Spooks. Uh, the Aurelia just able to jump on top of him. Malkai CC coming down too. That tower was way too low. He would have just been easily dived anyways. And oh, he didn't have any vision around. You see Shen all coming in. Yeah, follow through on the fight here. Eternal, really good job. They'd almost bait out Domino as well as Omu's ultimate there. So this Elise proactivity is coming quite nicely. And it's a 3,000 gold lead for now. But you have to feel like with the next dragon spawning in it just over a minute's time, that they're going to look over. Oh, no, you can't walk out oh, forward. Oh, heal coming out. Nope. No way, Electric comes down and secures that kill for the Elise and external rest. 4-0-3 on the Elise now. We did say she had to have this early game proactivity, had to be getting these kills in the early game. She's doing just that with now setting up to assassinate in this uh, jungle area and take out any of the blues that are trying to walk towards the Baron. The dragon, sorry. Yeah, they're getting really nice control down here. It says if you want to check out for this objective, you're going to have to basically dance with death here with Eternal. Grabbing himself another control ward. One minute remaining until the next dragon spawns. Of course, it is going to be a mountain dragon. And I don't see how Blue is actually meant to be able to contest this objective at all. Like, you walk through the jungle, you're more than likely going to die. Yeah, and there's just so much gold as well that they've just built for themselves. The one thing I will have to say for the Maokai, though, is only 59 or 60 CS at uh, this late in the game. Obviously, had that global map pressure, so it's traded the CS or the lane lead uh, or gold in general, as we see. Uh, oh, Lachlan um, manages just to dodge the canoe. Can you and get, get the earlier ult out, though? Which is pretty good. Um, so, very big. Yeah, all right, so... <laughs> Uh, apologies to everyone who's been watching. It turns out Bass Blue is the red team and Blackstone High is actually the blue team. So the, 
<laughs> me, me, me plays may have been a little bit inaccurate with our information for the past 16 minutes. We do apologize for that. But now we're good to go. So it's actually Bashful High that are in a dominant position, 4,000 gold ahead. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> probably when you get told the uh, information up with you, the broadcast. But I mean, as a result, we've now fixed that up, hopefully on stream and uh, we'll be a little bit more accurate. So Blackland are the team that's struggling just a little bit and back the team that's are doing quite well here. Up at the top now, look at this rotation coming out from the red side. The such a macro play, which is something you usually don't expect to see out of, you know, a high school team. And I know myself when I'm watching other high school games, a team that always end up doing really, really well, despite not having the highest ranked players either, is always a team that has just clean macro. They've been so practiced in the way they're playing the game, clearing vision out, making sure they have complete control over each and every area, making sure the entire team is set up, and as though they might, you know, individually as players and not be the greatest versus their opponents, you see these CS deficits in most lanes other than mid. Um, but overall as a team, they've just had so much more control, except for this mountain value, which sneakily Black are going to try and steal away here. They should be able to grab it as well. Yeah, they will, but will they get punished for a Lachlan? He doesn't have flash, he doesn't have flag and drag, he doesn't have any HP. Mind that as well, but at least he's able to grab himself one dragon Ooh. despite being 0 and 3. And this is huge as well. The ocean dragon being the uh, soul for the game means it's a massive advantage towards Bass High School. Uh, all their champions, especially their least, want to scale extremely well with this ocean dragon. Uh, and it just allows, I think, ocean dragon is by far the most overpowered soul. And I think it's stronger than Baron buff, actually, the soul buff. So this is huge um, for the red side who has that scaling disadvantage. And, uh, although they do have the scaling disadvantage, they're just so far ahead in gold. 5,000 for the 20 minute mark, pushing in on inhibitor towers in the mid lane at the moment. And it's just, man, it's so difficult for Blackstone to get back into this game because this Rise just needs to wait to get this Archangel staff up and running. He needs to have at least two, three items, especially now he doesn't have the Roa, to do anything in this game. And until that Rise is up and running, they really have no win conditions. The Nautilus is getting absolutely controlled. Yeah, they're trying to check out their own jungle, and there is simply no time of day that they're being given. And I think partly, um, basketball, they know. They know they don't want to give their opponents time to scale, because you look at Arise, and what do you think? You think <laughs> late game machine gun mage, uh, mage. So, remove him from the equation as much as possible. I mean, talking about this Rise, he is struggling quite a bit. Uh, about 1800 gold, if my math is correct, behind the Aurelia here. He hasn't technically got one full item, as he is still stacking his Archangel stuff about 200 mana off. Compare that to Aurelia, Wit's End and the Blade of the Rune King. Like, Spooks, I don't think he can hold this turret down in the bot side without some support that we're seeing coming out from Domino. Yeah, and you should see Aurelia as well going for this on-hit build rather than the Triforce build. Obviously, with Blade of the Ruin King being so strong and, of course, Ryze having that constant magic damage, the Wit's End is going to be so much more beneficial in this game. Oh, Spooks! They're just in a 3 versus 2 here. The reinforcements coming in. They will actually delete Aurelia very quickly. A massive shutdown of 300 going into the back pocket of the Misfortune. And they're not going to get punished for it. Yeah, exactly, right? That's just a fantastic pick out by all four. There was nothing else going on on the map. The Aurelia just pushed up a little bit too extended. Thought that herself and the Malka were going to be able to uh, contest this fight, but unfortunately will not be the case. And I think that's a good trade you'll take for the blue side, taking that Aurelia for absolutely nothing. Bane not even being able to secure that top side tower there. So big advantage uh, for uh, Black. Blackland, and that's going to be a big stepping stone to get themselves back into this game. As I was actually about to say, when I was talking about the Aurelia before she got caught out like that, the one thing you're going to have to do in this fight for the blue side is make sure you CC the Aurelia. If she can't get her Q stacked up, uh, and, uh, and as a result, the passive, she's going to be unable to do any DPS. And although the Vayne's another threat, Aurelia at the moment is that main mid game powerhouse that you really need to make sure she can't get snowball in these team fights. And it's important that they blow her up first and then look to take out the rest of the team. Yeah, and there's another thing that's caught my eye. We're talking about build paths and the important of them. Uh, the one that caught my eye is this Rise. Now, typically, we talked about Rise. We see Tear the Goddess um, into Ceres Embrace into the, of course, Rod of Ages for fantastic scaling. I feel like Spooks is aware that scaling perhaps isn't the time he's going to be given, as he started to go towards his Zonya's Hourglass and is basically forsaking the, play the um, Rod of Ages. Yeah, I mean, by the time you see a little... Ooh. <laughs> you know he wants his fight, but I realize that this is a fight he can win by himself. He's going to get taken down. The rest of his team coming in here. It's not going to save him. The two versus two teleports coming in as well from the Maokai. He will set up the fight. The Aurelia doing quite a bit here onto Omu. He's been left behind, abandoned, and forsaken from his team. 
I mean, uh, a very aggressive uh, play there by Domino's boy in the Auralist there, flashing to get the hook onto the Elise. That's uh, a juicy shutdown, 500 gold available if you're able to claim that kill and that bounty, but uh, unfortunately missed the flash hook and uh, it just kind of looks disaster if you're missing those two uh, abilities on any hook champion. I've done the same thing on Fresh many times, you flash, miss the hook, miss the play. We press the ultimate key and, and flex your mastery four. <laughs> yeah, we, we've all done that, except I've done that with mastery seven and it's just so much more humiliating there. Uh, <laughs> as we're seeing demolition duty coming out here from the side of baseball, they will grab themselves the bottom tier two, as well as now setting their eyes on the first of the ocean dragons here. Uh, Lachlan being a little bit cheeky there, but 30 seconds to the next dragon spawns, does Blackland actually have the opening to contest this dragon, or are they simply going to be forced to give it away? I think they're still not strong enough to contest yet. You'd really need Rise to have, you know, at least the Zonya's Hourglass completed, and you'd hopefully look to him towards, probably towards the Morel and Omicom next, uh, if he wants to have some decent damage in this fight as well. Bye bye, Shane. Yeah, I'm always in a lot of trouble here. He's pretty strong with, of course, the Sunfire Cape, and actually forces Effort back. Effort may be saying he isn't exactly worth it. Yeah, and the one thing I am actually surprised about is the Rise opted to go for these pen boots as well. Didn't uh, go for the Ninja Tabe, which I think are, you know, something you need to have versus a Federalia slash Yasuo. Uh, you know, even if you just get a cheeky Bramble Vest in the mid game versus this uh, Seeker's Arm Guard, Aurelia just can't do anything if you get a Bramble's Vest. It just absolutely destroys her as that item is so strong. Uh, into an auto, auto attack based champion, but another test coming out. Yeah, young boat's gonna go down here. There is no way in hell he gets out alive. Reinforcements from Spooks a little bit too late. And actually, maybe he's setting him up for disaster as CC coming out. Spooks didn't get to do anything. He just got deleted from the start. Time CC for all of it. And man, look at these KDAs on the red side. 6 and 0 on the Elise, 2 and 0, 8 on the Maokai, 4 2 3 on the Aurelia, and 3 4 on the Support Syndra, who's been doing surprisingly well uh, in that role. You generally see these off meta damage supports like the Lux or the Vagard not doing uh, very well within a game, but we're keeping on damage and moving straight to Baron here, uh, Bass High School. Yeah, 23 merit minutes, and they say, yeah, we got plenty of damage for this one. The Vein and the Aurelia, fantastic at tearing that objective apart here. As you mentioned before, the Syndra. I was expecting this Syndra to be like one and five at, you know, the 15 minute mark because we expected Lachlan to come visit the bot lane over and over. You force the fight with Domino's boys Nautilus, but it just never happened. And the proactivity coming out of Eternal's um, Elise has simply had a massive impact on the way this game has gone. Yeah, I feel like this is actually a game where you can say Jungle Gap was the deciding factor in this game. Of course, uh, you know, everyone on the on the red side has played very well, and it's a, definitely a team effort, and they've had such clean macro, but Eternal Rest being that main driving factor between getting these early kills at the start of the game and, and catching out so many people and controlling all of the vision around these big objectives has been such a crucial part of this team's macro, and is really one of the re real reasons why they are so far ahead in this game. Of course, we've reached a little bit of a lull with the Baron going down now, and the red side's now got to recuperate and, and look to get these waves shoving in and start applying pressure to these inhibitor towers. But, I mean, they are still kind of on a time bomb, right? Once Ryze gets his item stacked up, once Shen gets too tanky for Aurelia or Vayne to, to shove down on a couple autos, it's going to be very difficult to actually win these team fights as the massive CC abilities of the Nautilus, of the Shen, of the MF big team fight, and of course, Cataclysm on the Javan. The 5v5 fights should start to go the blue side's way in the next 5-10 minutes or so. So, as far as red side are ahead, 10k is a ridiculous amount of gold. Eventually, that gold's going to be less and less the more this game gets on. So, it's important they don't get complacent, they don't get excited with their lead, and they still continue and remain focused on ending this game. Yeah, I mean, with access to the Baron buff, it does make that just a little bit easier here. As I like to call it, 10,000 gold is the mark. Once you're 10,000 gold ahead, it is very, very hard to lose the game unless you make a series of catastrophic mistakes here. So we'll see. Fast baseball, they've done really good to build themselves up this lead. Three kills to 16, two dragons in their back pocket, five uh, turrets to none as well. And now it's simply the siege commencing it as a thing eternal, the same level as the opposing mid and deleting Ooh. spooks. He'll be able to drop the turret aggro and should be one more hit of flash. Isn't gonna save you as one hit takes it. The Fighter fighting the mage. 
Man, that is not what you want to see when your rise gets deleted by at least at 26 minutes into the game. And that pick could almost spell the end of the game overall. The Baron is still on all of these members here. So they're going to rush into the base. This inhibitor will fall. And, and it's going to be, again, a very difficult situation for Blackstone to try and get out of. But there is the one thing with high school games is these players are still, you know, young kids, right? Between the ages of like 15 to 17 or even 18, most of them. And, you know, they, they're not cool, calm, and quick. They love going for kills. They like playing this game for fun. And so you could see them make some crucial mistakes. But it looks like Pascal is playing such a clinical, controlled game. And they're going to just choke out the blue side. Yeah, it makes sense. When you're this far ahead, all you got to do is listen to your shot call. He's telling you how to do this. You just got to keep your calm here. Focus the turrets. Don't go overly heavily. Eternal. Be careful, buddy. As we're seeing an engage coming in. This could be the setup for the final fight. But Domino is so low. He's supposed to be one of the stars of the fight. And I'm getting a bit worried. Backside, they're not doing... Like, yes, I understand you are so far behind. If you take the team fight, you might just straight up lose the game. But if you just sit back and let yourself get sieged, you're also going to lose the game. You need to be a bit proactive. Mm, just the problem is they just can't clear out these super minions. They're just so hard to take down. You see... Two or star rotations from the rise is what's required to take out these minions with like 3,000 health. So it gets very difficult to clear, and they just really need to get a good five man cataclysm into a five man bullet time into Aurelia missing her ulti and uh, at least getting deleted instantly for them to even have a half a chance at winning one of these team fights. So it is just so difficult for them to do anything. And looks like the red side will be grabbing, uh, I believe they're one dragon off soul now, right? Or are they two off? Yeah, uh, they'll be one dragon off soul once they grab themselves their yeah. third dragon of the game here. And it's baseball. Taking this nice, slow, and academic. Honestly, the next place should be forced to be that top lane. The last inhibitor that stands against them. Recall, go top lane. And it's looking worse and worse for Blacksland High. I, I don't... Like, as you said, they're going to have to pull off a miracle team fight here if they want to come back in this situation. Yeah, it's going to have to be a miracle team fight coupled with a horrendous team fight from the uh, basketball roster here if they want to get back into this game. But... You never know, this is high school esports, and it's one of the most exciting things about it. It's just constant back and forth gameplay, and uh, we'll have to see exactly which team ends up with the victory. I mean, you would have to say it's probably a 95-5 or a 99-1 uh, game towards the red side and basketball high school. But uh, again, we are just waiting for these players to kind of decide exactly what they're going to do. Interesting enough, this Vang is 1-1-2 one, one, and two compared to the rest of their squad. Is, uh, hasn't been doing a lot, but taking out those jungle creeps, 173 farm on her is why well. she's looking towards that third item, and I mean, it really see the items as well being built on uh, both teams, right? You look at uh, this Maokai is obviously so tanky, so hard to kill, but Rai should be able to still do a decent amount of damage to him. No MR built. And Shen gone for no auto attack blocking items other than those Ninja Tabai, of course, to nullify the threat of the Aurelia. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the Zonia is now completed on the rise and he's looking towards, looks like the Death Cap. Uh, so maybe if he could potentially get another Needle to large rod, he could be doing enough DPS to maybe have some kind of staying in a fight. But again, is this just dragging the Merc Wolf into the lane here? <laughs> I wouldn't. It's a little bit of flexing there. As we're seeing, most of the enemy team has charged towards the top half. But Baseball, they're feeling confident here. But D4 is going to get caught out of position. This should be a very, very dead vein. But that will it'll be at least some consolation prize as they lose the last of the turrets outside of their base. Yeah, and I mean, that tower was going to go down anyway, so they can't really contest it there. But good on their side to actually be able to get a kill back in this game. And uh, the Vayne obviously making a mistake, pushing off a little bit too aggressively. And it uh, gives her side a little bit of a... Sorry, it gives the blue side a little bit of breathing room here. Only four members on the map, which means... I mean, I still reckon they'd win a fight 45. Um, but it's to be a little bit more difficult. And then now have to think a little bit harder about exactly what they're going to do. Ooh. Really yeah, good to, be out here. to be a little careful, yeah, force the flash to get out of one piece, though it will be fine as... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Omu and Domino, you probably don't want to be there, buddy. You are very far behind. Just, just run. I mean, Spooks pressed the realm warp and it was like, yeah, we're going to do it. And he's like, ah, uh, nah, I don't reckon. And just walked out and the other two were like, we're ready to go, we're ready to fight, rocked up. And we're like, ah, there's no damage. Well, we'll just uh, head on back to base. Don't mind us as... Uh, I go back and reset. 30 minutes now into the game is, is quite a substantial time uh, into it. And, and this gold lead is now getting smaller and smaller if you are uh, the blue side here. As, you know, once Rise hits his, hits his three items, he's, uh, you know, significantly stronger. And it doesn't matter how many more items you have. It's just so difficult to deal with. You can see the Baron is going to be the focus towards these teams for the next minute or so. And I think whoever gets this Baron will... Uh, look at Elise. 
Oh, and then Delise is just ending the game. Never mind. Delise is back going. She's got death cap. She's like, I don't want to be near Baron. I may be the jungler, but I'm needed in the enemy base here. And of all places, yeah, Elise is the worst person to be on Stop Duty, purely because you can't threaten Baron if your Elise is on the bottom half of the map. Yeah, it should be the Aurelia. Yeah, it should be the Aurelia, especially given the fact she opted for the teleport too. We see, oh, it's like coming through Aurelia, really. and a lot of trouble. I think she's gonna go down. Full of time going out across them, and not doing too much damage as it gets taken down. But let's keep our eyes on the fangs. He's finally getting hold of the fight. Taken low, but not taken down. The machine gun rise, though, is able to dish out a ton of damage here. But now it's a four versus three. Frankly, NBA Youngboat was able to say, Oh my god, Spoot is gonna get taken down. I don't see how he gets out of this in one piece. So we have to sit up. Going on to Omu, a lovely deletion from Youngbo. In fact, he gets deleted himself. Omu Q is just being such a terror of this Malka. He's so damn tanky. And now the turrets are under threat. D4. Let's see what he can do. Taking quite low. The follow through might actually be a little risky. One of the Nexus turrets finally falls, but Baseball may have messed up the fight a little bit. Yeah, I mean, once that Aurelia goes down, she's pretty much your main carry threat, at least. As long as you can burst a carry, you can see Ryze is now strong enough, has Azonias and the Seraphs active, and is actually able to survive that full burst combo and still have enough shielding on his Seraphs to get out, which means it's one of those things where Fastball, I said, they, you know, they have to end the game in the next 5 and 10 minutes, and, you know, if it gets to 35 minutes into this game, this Ryze is going to be a, a, sorry, a, a very, very powerful force, and I think these team fights start going the way of uh, Blacksland High School. And, you know, it might be the only way that the Red Tide's going to end the game is through a sneaky Baron steal or, you know, a backdoor. Yeah, or they should be a little more careful with their team fighting, perhaps. That was a very spread out fight where Eternal got caught out and then the rest of his team came in to help him. And we'll see how the oh, souls being taken. They ha I feel like they had to contest this. You do not they want to give up no but uh, they're instead they're waiting them. and they're waiting too long. Yeah, not aiming that objective perfectly there. And unfortunately, the Ocean Dragon does go over to Basketball High School, who will just transition this straight into Baron, right? That's where they're walking off towards. Yeah. And uh, they will take this Baron and assumably what, march it straight down mid lane and end the game. One Nexus Tower is all that stands to the blue side. And it's very, very difficult to defend against an Ocean Soul plus Baron buff team. Yeah, but there are at least a few people to the post here. Young Boat does have himself two core items. He gets the Retriever and he can hit the end. As well as building towards his um his zeal upgrade. The death cap finally picked up for Spooks as well. Assuming we don't see Eternal basically one shot the rise at the start of the fight, he could also be a huge threat for his team. But he's gotta stay safe. So many times we see him getting caught by cocoons, and it goes so badly for his team. So let's see if he's safe and see how that goes. Yeah, precisely right, especially and now that he's finished this death cap, he is going to be doing a ridiculous amount of damage uh, for the entire roster of the blue side. I can get a very nice uh, spread on his blocks uh, and pop it all with that. A Q is going to be doing a ridiculous amount of damage. Yeah, a huge damage right there. And now the misfortune has completed her zeal item, decided to go for the rapid fire cannon. So everybody here on the side of Black Swan does at least have two items ready to go for what could eventually be the final fight and it's one where black sign are gonna have to be the ones engaging because <coughs> because they're getting seized by baron you have to actually be the ones to pull the trigger yeah precisely right even though they've got this baron buff they're just playing so uh safe right? even though they just got a very they're just so far ahead they just need to play a little more aggressive and just go and end the game but they're just kind of relaxing maybe looking for those kills a little bit and you know playing a little bit more for fun than is is to win but uh, overall, you know, both these sides just relaxing a little bit, trying to find an opportunity. And, uh, you know, the red side, obviously, much more powerful here. Blacks and it, just trying to keep their base alive and aren't able to move. We'll have to see exactly which team will come up on top in this next fight, which I think should decide the game. Yeah, more than likely it will here. 12 thousand gold in favor of baseball here as they are charging through the middle of the base for five members sorry strong baron puff in their pocket as well the siege is commencing here and i mean throwing out whatever abilities you want because you've got ocean soul you've got all of the health and mana regeneration in the world right now here for the side of baseball Precisely, this is his last Nexus Tower where Blacksmen are going to have to make their team. Oh, the fight coming through here on the bottom side of the Nexus. They're losing their team immediately. Both sides coming out, not working out. They'll lose everybody here for the side of Blacksmen. They're trying to hold on. Not that it'll matter. The only member alive, Spook, forced to flee on to the fountain. That might not save him as the Nexus falls and Baseball takes the win. 
Yeah, a very commanding victory from Baseball. Maybe a little bit slower. Probably going to end that game about 10 minutes earlier. But uh, regardless, Blackstone held on there and did very well. And man, look at the time. It's almost 10 minutes before we jump into our next game for tonight. So very close schedule today due to the fact that uh, the server will be going down at 7.30 p.m. So uh, we've only got a little bit of time left before uh, these high school games need to be wrapped up. But Wayne, what a game. Yeah, an amazing game there from baseball. They were being super proactive. We talked about the fact that they at least needed to be active in the early game. And in a scoreline of an 8 11 yeah, I think she did her job and did her job damn well. Yeah, I mean, she has 23,000 damage, the highest damage dealer for her entire team, despite the fact that Aurelia looked like she was doing work in those team fights. Elise was just banging up everybody. And I'd have to say, by far, uh, Eternal Rest was the MVP for that game. Yeah, stepping up on here. And that is, of course, Baseball High taking the game over Blacksland. Guys, thank you so much for joining us for our first game of the night. But as we were saying before, 10 minutes and our second game will be right on the way. So I'm pretty sure do not go anywhere. Our second game is right around the corner where we have Blakehurst High going up against Parramatta High.